Thank you so much, TJ. Good morning, Board of Commissioners, our department heads, and the citizens of Douglas County. We will call this Monday, May 3rd, 2021, uh, virtual Microsoft Teams uh, work session to order. And before I start, I would like to make sure and uh, acknowledge our commissioners to make to ensure that we have a quorum this morning. I'll start with District 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell III. Present. Thank you. District 2 and Vice Chairman um, Robinson. Present. District 3, Commissioner Terenia Carthen. Present. District 4, Commissioner Ann jones Guider. Here. Okay, and Ramona Jackson Jones present. We have a quorum board of commissioners. Uh, this morning, clerk, uh, first of all, before we start, I wanted to introduce, if he's on the line, our new, our new IT director, uh, Mr. Alex Benton Court. Are you on the line by any chance? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, would like to, if you could turn your camera on. I just wanted to introduce you to the board of commissioners and then also to our department heads and then to the citizens of Douglas County. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, to serve the Board of Commissioners, the uh, staff, and the citizens of Douglas County. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Bentecourt, and again, welcome. And we're so excited that you're here. All right, Lisa, Clerk, uh, Clerk, do we have any uh, public comment today? Uh, yes, ma'am. We had Mr. LaVon Dixon sign up to speak this morning. Uh, but before we call on him to speak, I just want to remind um, the speakers to um, please remember that you have three minutes to address the board. Uh, when I call on you, please restate your name and your subject matter. And once your three minutes are up, I will alert you so you can wrap up your comments. Okay, so I'll call on Mr. LaVon Dixon. Are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good morning, uh, uh, Commissioner Chair Jackson Jones. Uh, my my comments are going to be related to uh, a meeting that uh, you were on, uh, Ms. Jackson Jones, and also the Commissioner Robinson, probably uh, about six weeks ago. Uh, I think we had one council meeting in between this, and uh, I'm actually just being able to address this issue. Uh, there was an article that I read uh, in the paper regarding. Uh, in Douglas County, uh, and uh, and by uh, Commissioner Robinson being sued, uh, being sued uh, for violation of an original agreement that he entered into that wound up costing the taxpayers around one hundred and sixty three thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I'm trying to get some some additional feedback and, and get some some logic behind it. That seems like an extremely large sum uh, uh, the expense uh, for the city and for taxpayers to have to pay. Uh, and uh, I guess my I have probably about ten questions related to that. Uh, and I would like to, uh, a direct answer associated with, that, with these questions that I'm going to uh, uh, be uh, addressing to the council members uh, today. So if, I know you can't respond to them today, but I would like for someone to respond to them to, to me at, at, at some juncture uh, uh, from this standpoint. And, and I'll begin uh, uh, by just kind of running through the questions that I put forward. Uh, and my, my initial question is, how was it determined that this was a taxpayer expense and that the taxpayers should cover this cost? Uh, from my understanding of the, uh, of the article that I read, there was an original agreement that was an to by the commissioner, uh, Robinson, not to not to try to block citizens from making uh, comments or making uh, critical comments about himself. And the commissioner unilaterally, as a person, decided to violate that agreement that he had signed into action. Uh, from that standpoint, he made, a, he made a personal choice to violate that agreement itself. So I'm trying to figure out why was it passed upon the citizens of Douglas County to cover those costs for private action that he had taken uh, from that standpoint. Uh, the other action, uh, question I have associated with that is, this this action that was taken by the, the couple attorneys uh, from the standpoint of, I guess they call them uh, First Amendment issues, uh, there were some of the actions that were taken through other elected officials throughout the state. All the other elected officials complied <clears throat> complied with the initial agreement. They had no violations. They really stopped blocking citizens from making comments and so forth. Well, it was just happened in Douglas County where I entered this register with my commissioner, uh, Mr. Robinson decided that he wanted to, to, to violate the agreement that he had signed into, uh, for example. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out was there any, I guess, uh, comments, comments that you have with Commissioner Robinson to determine what type of violations he may have had, and was there some type of additional recourse associated with that? being that every other person who had been involved in agreements like this 
signed the agreements, but for some reason or another, uh, the commissioner uh, Robinson decided not to not sign those agreements. Uh, that seems to be kind of odd. Uh, and I, I just find it kind of apprehensible that Douglas County residents should have the responsibility for taking on those attorney fees associated with that. Uh, the other aspect of it is if those attorney fees had to be covered, uh, I'm trying to figure out what government fund was used to pay the fees uh, from the standpoint. Was it in the budget? Uh, did we have to cut some costs or, 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 or cut some costs to certain districts uh, uh, for, the, for the, the couple of expenses associated with that? Uh, was it spread out evenly over the districts, or did some districts have to? Uh, have to did, uh, my district itself, which is I'm a, a member, uh, Commissioner Robinson's district, did we have to bear the full cost of this expense? Uh, I kind of want to uh, get an idea of what city projects had to be sacrificed associated with this uh, uh, for violating Mr. Agreement. Dixon. Uh, we, yes. I'm sorry, your your three minutes are up. So if you could just please wrap okay. it up. Sure. Okay, well, I will. What I'll do is I'll send out the additional. Uh, I probably have about six or seven more questions, and I will send out the additional questions to the committee uh, committee members, uh, to the council members. I'm sorry, no disrespect intended with that comment. I'll send out my additional questions to the to the, uh, the council members, and hopefully get the feedback from from uh, my city council uh, uh, members as well. And I thank you all for your time, and I appreciate everything. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Uh, we didn't have any uh, anyone else sign up for public comment, but is there anyone else on the line that would like to speak this morning? Okay, Chairman, being none, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Clerk Watson, and uh, thank you again, Mr. Dixon, for coming in and sharing your comments with the Board of Commissioners this morning. Uh, Board of Commissioners, we have two presentations this morning, and our presenters, I'm requesting 10 minutes each for each our presenter as we certainly uh, are mindful of our time, our meetings are just extremely long and we wanna make sure that we are being respectful to our citizens, the ones who are joining us to, to review these meetings and they're really engaged and I want to make sure that our citizens remain engaged. Uh, with that being said, Board of Commissioners, tomorrow you have the approval of the minutes. I want you to just be mindful of that and please review the minutes accordingly and uh, be prepared to approve or deny. Um, also, we have two proclamations tomorrow. Board of Commissioners, we have one uh, proclaiming the month of May as National Drug Court Month in Douglas County. That'll be read by Ms. Dina Davis. And then we have tab number seven, which is proclaiming the month of May as Mental Health Awareness Month in Douglas County. And that'll be read by our External Affairs Director, Tiffany Stewart Stanley. So Board of Commissioners, what I'm gonna do is pivot back to our presentations this morning. I asked uh, Mr. Gil Shirouse to come in and provide an update to you, Board, uh, regarding WSA, the project overview, view, things that are going on. We just had our last, uh, about two weeks ago, we had a, our, our annual spring retreat and wanted to make sure that our Board of Commissioners were made abreast of what's going on <clears throat> at the WSA Water School Authority level. Mm -hmm. I, I hear you. you should know. May I have? Yeah, you may have the floor. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Real quick, we, we rolled through that pretty quickly. I want to um, highlight um, two things. The, the, um, the public comment, all those comments should go through our, our attorney accordingly. Um, that is a legal matter, and so there will not be any re direct response from me. Secondly, as it relates to the, um, which is a settled matter. Secondly, as it relates to the uh, meeting minutes, county clerk. Uh, we had a conversation regarding clarity on the Veterans Court. Um, can you please um, make sure we reconcile that um, regarding the $150,000 that was reamended or reappropriated, $100,000 for CSB, specifically between the Solicitor General and the um, DA, and then the remaining $50,000 was for, um, $31,253 was for the coroner um, supplement that's effective this week. Uh, and remaining balance of 18,000, I guess 747 is for her operating account. Can you please reconcile that and make sure we're able to amend that accordingly? In the budget, I didn't see it this weekend. Please. Yes, sir, I sure will. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. All right, we have our first presentation this morning uh, by Mr. Bill Shigarow. This is the WS Project. Someone needs to mute you. In my opinion, a lot of background. Everybody, please mute your mics. Mr. Gil Shirouse, are you on the line? I am, yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I can. You have the floor. 
Okay, thank you very much for inviting me today to provide you with a brief update of our capital improvements program. And, and before I start, I want to thank all the elected officials for just the decades of support of our organization. It's a great relationship we have with both the commission and the city council. Um, also, it's a great day. It's raining today, if you haven't noticed, outside of your windows. And I know it's just by happenstance, but if you didn't know, the first Monday in May in the state of Georgia is also Water Professionals Appreciation Day. So it's another great day for us water professionals in the state of Georgia for that reason, too. Um, I appreciate you having me on today to talk about projects. As you can imagine, um, I can only present a few of the many projects we do each and every year to provide the top tier water, sewer, and stormwater services to both Douglasville and Douglas County residences and businesses. I mean, I'll just remind the, the commissioners um, today, as many of you already do this, um, I continue to invite you to reach out to me with any questions about not just these projects, any other projects we do, or any other things about our organization. I, I truly do enjoy um, engaging with you guys on any of the things that that we do. Um, I don't know, are y'all seeing the slide deck that I put together? Um, there was slides presented. I'm not sure if you're seeing it. If you are, um, we can start rolling through that. Right. Hold on. Okay. So I'll, I'll just keep talking through that. Um, yes, you can go on to the next. You can go ahead and go to the next page when you're ready. Um, as part of our annual budgeting process, Madam Chair just mentioned we just had our budget workshop with our board of directors a couple of weeks ago. So she wanted me to report out some of the projects we we're working on for our community. We update our full five-year CIP. We proud prioritize projects based on you know, our mission and um, work very closely with both the city and county planning groups on the growing needs of the community. Um, a sizable portion of our CIP is what we call renewal projects. Basically, that's keeping up with asset, assets as they age and need to be rehabilitated or replaced. Um, we own, operate, and maintain nearly $1 billion in assets. So as you can imagine, keeping up with these assets is quite a sizable task, but those projects aren't terribly interesting. So I'm going to cover today just a few of our larger projects that I thought you would find most relevant. And most of these I would kind of put in the capacity expansion um, category. So the first page you're seeing is our water and sewer summary of projects, and we'll produce about $40 million in projects each year. About half of that is the reservoir project I'll cover in a minute, um, and we're using bond proceeds to fund that. Outside of the reservoir, our normal annual CIP ranges from about 15 to $20 million per year. If you could go to the next slide, please. This next slide is basically a similar looking page. It's a summary of our stormwater five-year CIP. This covers the projects that we perform as part of the stormwater management contracts we have with both the city and the county. We have essentially completed all of the large programs and projects now, so the stormwater CIP is basically replacing all of the smaller culverts under city and county roads. We typically produce about $2 million in stormwater CIP each year, and that's basically to work down the backlog of what is now over 100 pipes that need to be replaced right now, and there's um, more and more coming onto the list each and every year. And next slide, please. The first project I'd like to address is our meter replacement project. I know many of you know about this program. We've been working on it for about 10 years now. This is to replace all of the 43,000 customer meters that we have in our system. We're replacing those with what's, with what's called a smart metering program. Sometimes it's referred to as AMR, AMI, or some of the acronyms you might hear. Well, we're finally wrapping up this program this year. It will end up costing about $21 million. Um, we've been in literally the front yard of every house and every business in, in the system over this time. Um, certainly some efficiencies gained in both meter reading and water conservation, but the heart of a project like this is really about elevating the customer service experience. There are a lot of, a lot of additional tools that we gain on that side of the house that are, are, are really exciting to be able to produce for our customers. The next slide, please. The next project um, all of you have heard about at this point is our Dog River Reservoir expansion. We've been working on this project now for almost 10 years already, believe it or not. And we've been evaluating long-term needs of our community and long story short, determined that additional water supply storage 
is a critical need for us both now and over the next 50 year planning horizon. And yes, we do a 50 year water planning horizon. Um, after years of evalu evaluating alternatives, coordinating with our federal and state partners, um, the option that was chosen was to expand our current Dog River Reservoir. Last year, we received the permit from the Corps of Engineers and are now off and running on what is an approximately $150 million project to raise the water surface elevation by 35 feet, so additional 35 feet higher, and we will more than triple the capacity of our sto uh, current storage. Uh, the project really involves about six separate projects. I won't go into details today. You can see those on your slide, but it's, it's really a project of projects. It includes doing a number of projects that will take it approximately seven years from permit issuance late last year from, from that time until we are able to start filling the expanded reservoir. As of right now, we have um, Per, uh, gotten the permit, which is the big thing. We've um, purchased our necessary environmental mitigation credits for $18 million. We're under design on all of the components you see um, on that list, and we are working on property acquisition. You'll start seeing projects start to start to happen over the next year as we do some of the, the ancillary projects. The actual dam itself will start probably in about two to three years. Um, as you know, the county is one of our neighboring properties on this project and we appreciate um, you guys working with us on that property acquisition. You'll see that be finalized over the next few weeks or month or so. Um, and, and one of the opportunities I'm, I'm just really most excited about is um, going forward with the potential for passive use trails as you guys have planned on your county property at Dog River Park. Some of the property we've already acquired abuts the county's property so we have we have a lot of potential to extend the county's trail plan across some of our property connect up with highway 166 maybe even the recreation complex on the other side of the reservoir so just a lot a lot of potential there that um, is going to be really nice to see for our um, residences and business owners in the future um, next slide please The next project I'll cover is about Lee Road widening. Um, you guys know what's happening there um, with that project that the county and the D, uh, state DOT are working to widen Lee Road from I-20 to Lee Road, I'm uh, sorry, from I-20 to Fairburn Road. Um, we have significant water and sewer line relocations to perform as part of our infrastructure that exists there. We have about, um, mostly the, the big part is about 15,000 feet of eight inch water line to move out of the way of the expanded roadway. We are taking this opportunity to upsize this line to a 20 inch line. This is part of our long-term distribution plan improvements. This is something we need in the future. We're going ahead and taking the opportunity to um, upsize that line. We'll spend about five and a half million dollars on this project. And basically that'll just be completed as part of the, um, the roadway widening project. So we'll be one of the many utility contractors out on that site over the next couple of years. Next slide, please. Um, on the wastewater side of the house, um, I thought I'd talk about wastewater capacity upgrades um, as a whole. We, we have a number of projects in that um, kind of subcategory. I, I put four of them up on a, a slide together. I'll talk about as a group. Um, first off, on the South Central wastewater treatment side, um, that, that area treats basically the, the central, southern, and um, southwestern part of our county. That plant is currently running approximately 3 million gallons a day. It's already rated for 6 million gallons a day, so we have plenty of capacity already, but we are currently underway with another uh, capacity upgrade project there to go ahead and upgrade that capacity to 9 million gallons a day. We have an opportunity to do that um, now for significant savings over doing it. In the future, that'll be about a $2 million project. That is already under design and should be completed over the next two years. Also in the South Central Basin, um, as you guys know, we're underway with a project to make sewer available to another 4,500 acres in the southwestern portion of the county. Basically, that would be between Highway 5 and the Dog River Reservoir, and, and that system would uh, simply just expand the system um, that we've built around the St. Andrews area. This will be an approximately $3 million project that's already under construction if you um, go down in that area you'll see you'll see pipes sitting on the ground being ready to be laid clearing 
underway, that project should be complete in about a year. Um, just a reminder, I know um, this question comes up a good bit from, from the board. When we do projects like this to expand sewer in areas, our job primarily is to <clears throat> basically run a backbone system. Um, and then developments will build whatever infrastructure, pay for the infrastructure costs to come get to it. And then developments, as they connect to our system, they pay their pro rata share of the infrastructure that we install by way of the water and sewer tap on and connection fee. Um, on the other side of the wastewater system, the north side and Sweetwater Creek wastewater treatment plant systems provides wastewater treatment to basically the northern and eastern portion of the county. Sweetwater Creek is our major facility in that basin. It's um, close to running at capacity. Um, we've already secured another 3 million gallons a day of capacity in Cobb's system and are working on a project to affect that flow transfer to Cobb. Uh, we'll pay for capacity with Cobb County as it's needed and the total amount of approximately $18 million. And this is in lieu of a much more expensive plant expansion that was considered over the last probably 15 years or so. The project to transfer the flow is approximately four, uh, I'm sorry, is approximately $4 million. Um, it's been designed, it's under easement acquisition. We're finalizing that phase right now and should go out to bid in just a few months. Um, but with not doing the expansion to Sweetwater Creek, we now have to perform some upgrades to this 30 year old facility, both from an aging perspective and to address new regulations. Preliminary design is complete on that. We are working on detailed plans and specifications as we speak and projects for that upgrade will be completed over the next five years or so and costs will be approximately $8 million. Next slide, please. So the final project I'd like to, to talk about is to highlight something on the stormwater side. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, while the majority of what we're doing today is small culvert replacement, when we, when we first began operations under the contracts with the city and the county for stormwater services, we had to do a number of larger, kind of more programmatic projects, one of which was to update the community's flood studies and resulting flood insurance rate maps that were out of date, and those have now been completed. As part of that study, we took the opportunity to evaluate every structure within the mapped floodplain, and over those last 10 years or so, we've worked with the National Flood Insurance Program, FEMA, and GEMA to mitigate the residential structures that were eligible under those programs. Generally speaking, they provide 75% funding and we provide the other 25% match and we manage the projects. It is a voluntary program on the part of the residents, so some have chosen not to participate and of course they may come back over time, but for those who did participate, we have mitigated 33 residential properties um, from the floodplain. This means that 33 families no longer live in a house that is subject to repeated flooding and 33 structures that do not require emergency services when a flood occurred. Well, I'm pleased to report today that we've now gone through the entire system and we just in the last month completed the final flood prone structure mitigation. It's a huge success for our community. I'm really excited about being able to report that we're um, essentially through that program again. Some may come up over time, um, but a, a, a big program being done in our community. So I wanted to share that with the board today. Again, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and present that. I know it was uh, quick and, and kind of high level, but if you do have other questions, I, I do invite you anytime, reach out to me. Um, I appreciate our continued great working relationship with both the board and the staff. And, and again, I appreciate you letting me be here today. Happy to take any questions if, if you'd like at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Sherrells. Board of Commissioners, do we have any questions for our um, Executive Director WSA. Okay, there are no questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Sherrod. It was a great presentation. Okay, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, Chairman, I believe uh, okay. Commissioner Robinson. Oh, okay, Commissioner Robinson has a question. Okay, I didn't, your mic is muted, uh, Commissioner. Can you hear me now? There. Yeah, we can hear you now. So sorry, okay. your mic is muted. Yeah, okay. it keeps getting cut off for some reason. All right, so. Um, Gail, good morning. I'll be quick. Morning. We're in a new format. Um, talk to me about um, um, there were some incomplete communities that existed um, within the county a couple of years ago, and you were gracious enough to enter into an arrangement with us. Um, it's what we call pipe cities. Uh, there were roughly what about nine communities in the um, unincorporated. 
Um, did we ever accomplish all that body of work? And um, what can you tell me about that? Sure, thank you, Vice Chair Robinson. Um, so we have essentially completed all of those projects. I, I think you're right, there are eight or nine communities. I can't remember exact, exactly how many, but yes, we, we've done all the work under that agreement, um, except for one uh, subdivision, Polk Place, that is on hold by the developer right now. They are still working through what that subdivision looks like. So we have a kind of a, a pin in that project. All of the others have been completed. And, and I have to say, most of them have started or have completed building out. I went through um, Palmer Falls a month or two ago after we went through and um, did the work in that one. And I mean, they are, they, they're humming out there building houses. Some of them haven't started building yet, but I, I'm sure they're coming. But um, all of our work from the stormwater perspective has been done. And, and that was a great program between us and the, the Board of Commissioners. We appreciate your, your involvement in that. Yeah, now I, I want to give context that because that that was important. I think it was around 18 or so, 2018, and you had um, small builders um, that pretty much had, um, you know, from the Great Recession had pretty much tanked out here in Douglas County. And I remember they came to a meeting that Madam Chair was sort of helping facilitate. And they were asking to to sort of like, uh, can you create an atmosphere in which we can, um, you know, continue to feed? That, that's bottom line. And yet. I'm looking around within the community and I'm seeing all these pipes. And to make it affordable for them, they say, look, can you help us replace those pipes and stuff? And since you guys have upgraded the code and stuff and let us continue because the big guys are fine, but the small guys, which Douglas County was built on, um, uh, it, it mattered. And so the board commissioners voted 5-0 to enter into an arrangement with WSA to be able to pull that off. In other words, we'll, we'll pay for the replacement of those pipes on the cheap, allow you guys to keep your margins. And so I, I want to highlight how we work together because it was dragging on my digest. Think about the digest. You got 454 homes that are not on the digest and they're just sitting there. It was blight, I'm sorry, slum, no, no, blight in communities. And that was important. So real quick, and I'm sure I'm going to yield for it. Um, James Worthington, can you add to this? Uh, I know there was two parts. There was water and sewer, but what was the other parts of this? James Worthington? Yes. yes, sir. Can you... Yeah, can you clarify the rest of that story? Just sure. Kind of... um, yeah, so uh, the pipes were the main portion, and basically we had a lot of those um, building permits were kind of on hold waiting on a lot of those things to be resolved. Now that all of that has been resolved as a joint effort, most of those building permits have been pulled, and as Gil had mentioned before, most of those are completed now. So. We basically knocked all of those out and kind of cleaned up those portions of the county. Okay, so it's it's what the recession happened back in 08. This is 2020. It's taken what 12, <laughs> 13 years. I mean, just give context. 13 years to recover from the last recession, and it took Correct. the government's help to be able to do that at the local level. That's important about taxpayer dollars. That was important. And so anyway, I've got to yield the floor, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'm good. You're muted, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. I was talking to myself. Are there any other questions from the board? Thank you so much, Vice Chairman yeah. Robinson. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Commissioner Mitchell, I, I hear you. Yeah. Commissioner okay. Mitchell. So, so Gil, how are you? First of all, uh, thank you for that great presentation. I think that was really well. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Welcome. But my, my, I guess my first question though is, okay, um, with with the stormwater runoff, and I can only speak for this on the north side. I know you and I have had conversations about a couple of uh, individuals that are over on the north side that have had some issues with, um, I guess, from that side of running off from, uh, I don't know. The, the, the situation that we've encountered. So with that, are those some of those properties that you guys have went and bought or, or to keep them out of that flood plan situation or are these a whole totally different conversation that you guys have had or having? So so briefly, I, I think the ones that we've talked about recently, you know, haven't been in this program. There are a number on um, like the Mountain Creek Way area. So that'd be off of Malone Road. Those are some that were in the map flood plan there. There are very tight restrictions on what properties um, are eligible for acquisition under that program. They have to be within a mapped 100-year floodplain, and they have to have some, um, you know, some repetitive loss component 
to it. I, I think the thing that we see more often than not in the, the stormwater side of what we deal with, and probably this is what you're talking about, Commissioner Mitchell, is just, I would say, like general runoff issues. So, you know, water water's coming down a stream, water's coming off of properties, comes across somebody's property and, you know, you know may realistically or may from a perception standpoint cause property damage. And, and so our role, and according to the contracts we have with the city and the county, is, is very finite. So our, our role is to manage the stormwater program from an administrative standpoint, to manage development control, to um, take a part with the city and the county as a floodplain administrator. There's, you guys are still the floodplain administrator. We play a, a technical role there. And then as it relates to infrastructure, our responsibility basically begins and ends at the right-of-way line. That's how it's uh, very clearly defined in, in the contract. So when those you know, stormwater problems occur outside of the public road right-of-way, they are technically a private property matter. We cannot go you know, onto private property to address. But what we do as kind of a, a benefit to the customers or to the, you know, the rate payers, the taxpayers of Douglas County is we, we provide a lot of technical assistance. So we send engineers out there, and I'll, I'm reminded of one we just dealt with, in your district, Commissioner Mitchell, off of K Springs Road, they had some mm -hmm. some sinkholes from berry pits, right? So certainly not a stormwater issue, but you know we went out, investigated it, kind of figured out what the the issue was. Ended up not being stormwater, but we're able to provide a lot of technical guidance and resources to our our customers for for that reason. So we're able to provide that. We we do a lot of um, televising of storm drains that are on private property, and you know looking at what problems are, and then giving um, guidance on how property owners can fix their private property with us. I, I guess that's how I, I address yeah, that kind I of more that. simply. And, and, and thank you for doing that much. And I know you and I have many, and your team have many conversations about a lot of uh, unique situations on that northern side of, uh, of the corridor. So I, I get it. So that's, that's great. So my other question, though, so with those that you say you've come up with some of the floodplains um, that have actually been within the floodplain, and now they've actually been, uh, I'm assuming, bought out of that be the right word to say that you guys have bought those guys out to uh, eliminate them from that floodplain or 50 year flood or I mean kind of help me understand that side. Yes sir so the process just real real quick is they're identified through a study we go do a detailed um, evaluation of the structures elevation certificates and those kind of things get them qualified for a grant we get grant funding we then approach the property owners with an offer it's a fair market value offer um, if they accept it then we acquire the property we do demolition services we restore the property to a grade that will drain properly and then we maintain the property in perpetuity so that that's a covenanted property in the records of the court so nothing can ever be built on that again and then if it's if it's in a residential area which most of these are we we start cutting the grass so there we have dozens of these properties on our grass cutting list because we want to be a good neighbor to the residents we'll, we'll also talk to the neighboring property owners and some may want it to kind of go back to a natural state so we'll we'll basically let some go back to a natural wooded state if that's what if that's what the neighbors want if that's what that community wants to see on those properties so so how, how does how does the tax record side of that thing works with you guys owning the property i guess uh sure so it, it comes off the tax roll with us okay. owning it of course you know it's a it's a flood it's a flooded property there's no structure on it so i would i'd have to imagine there wouldn't be a lot of tax value to it but with it with us being an owner of it it would come off the tax digest got well, it and, and, thank and that, excuse me guys this is this is jason the ema director there we still got a warning a tornado warning going on they just issued for lithia springs area i just want to put that out there real quick yeah. um so i'm sorry to interrupt but i'm trying to no. want to make sure people are aware of that and that lithia area thank you appreciate it okay so, 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 but with that, how are we communicating that to the tax assessors and or the tax uh, commissioner that these are now no longer on the roll so they can kind of, you know, kind of make that digest adjustment and so on? So I, I won't try to speak out of turn because I do water and sewer and I don't do taxes, <laughs> but when we, when we buy any property, it goes through the deed process. And, and my presumption then is that, that they pick up somehow through the the court system, you know, the records of the court, just like any other property transfer, um, it, it become we, we deed it. So it's a deeded lot to us. So it goes through that that process. Okay. And, and I can't and, tell you what happens after that, Commissioner. But. I understand. And, and I just, I'm saying it out loud so that our tax commissioners and board of assessors and others kind of hear that, that 
we don't want to see that coming back to say we we were either short or we we anticipated a whole lot more than what we are actually going to get or receive based on the mere fact of these how many 150 how many did you mention that you guys have actually dealt with 33 30 all 30 out of those 33 lots that could well that will come off the tax roll and uh, there won't be any collections on that because of the, the structure and what what we actually were falls under now so it just you know food for thought so I'm, I, I can see uh, our county manager is, is adhering and, and, and taking notes on that on that so that we can make sure that our constitutional officers meaning the tax commissioner and others to understand that they need to kind of look ahead and forecast that number of 33 lots that won't be a part of uh, any uh, collection basically so but thank you Gil great job great presentation uh, again I'm going to yield the floor so I won't kind of take too much of your time so thank you again to Madam Chair I yield the floor thank you Commissioner okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell, and thank you again, Gil. We're going to move on, Board of Commissioners, but what I want to do is allow our time for our county administrator, if she had any business, simply because we have a tornado that may touch down, and I know she would have to discuss matters with her immediate staff, particularly Jason Mihal, and if something goes south. So I want to allow an opportunity for our county administrator, Sharon Subedan, if you could, just do you have the floor, uh, if you have uh, any if matters. You have any matters. Um, good morning, everybody. First and foremost, everybody needs to be safe. If you're in the tornado impacted area, make sure to follow appropriate emergency management guidelines and take cover. Um, from my perspective, um, it's been a busy two weeks um, getting on board and getting settled. I do want to let you know, um, chair and board, that we are gonna be actively working on our return to work and open to the public plan. Um, we certainly are taking into consideration the information provided to us by public health. So we're not doing this um, recklessly and or in a vacuum, but um, directors are back in the office today so I, I told them I'll be looking forward to seeing their smiling faces. Um, and the, what will happen next is they will be working closely together to put together a plan that allows our employees to feel safe when they come back into the workplace. And also our public um, transitioning back into our public spaces. And so we'll be looking at technology and obviously observing all of the CDC guidelines. Masks are required in all um, Douglas County facilities. And um, unless of course, like we are now in a private space with the door closed. So that's just a reminder to everybody, please wear your mask, even if you're vaccinated. And anytime I have the opportunity, I also plug getting vaccinated, protect yourself, protect others, and help us to go back to being able to live in um, relative normalcy. But Madam Chair, that's all I have for the board at this time today. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, so much. Appreciate you, County Administrator. And great job so far. I know it's been a rigorous two weeks for you, but you've done a great job. We appreciate everything that you're doing to make uh, Douglas County great. Um, I'm going to move on and then I'm going to move on to our next presentation. Certainly want to give our county administrator an opportunity because the weather is looking a little we're dreary out there. So I'm just concerned as well. I'm going to move on to our next presentation is the county's legal organ assessment and it will be based on operational and performance uh, audit of the probate court office and operational and performance audit of the office of the superior and state court clerk. Malden and Jenkins here, but um, who's it, who's actually leading this first before Malden and Jenkins come on? And I'm not sure who the representative is from Malden and Jenkins. Who do we have here? Is it Mr. Roberts? Is that you? Yes, Madam Chair. My name is David Roberts, and I'm leading from Malden and Jenkins. Okay, Mr. Roberts, you have the floor this morning. How are you doing, first of all? And thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for your time, Madam Chair, and uh, doing doing well. And you can see the dark storm behind behind me. So, <laughs> okay, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And if I could, I, I sent the presentation to communications. Uh, so if they could pull it up, I appreciate it. Okay, um, we apologize. Hold on one moment. Did it come from you, Mr. Roberts? 
let's see. Uh, it came from the county administrator. The county administrator. Yeah, I sent it to you, Rick, just before the meeting when I got it. Okay. Okay. I'm pulling it up. And I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and start. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the for the floor, and and thank you, uh, Vice Chair Robinson. Certainly appreciate your your sponsorship and and leadership throughout the project. So in November of, of 2020. Uh, Judge Chris Christina Peterson uh, was elected to probate court and Miss Anita Danley Stembridge was elected to clerk of Superior Court and State Court. Uh, as the two were both newly elected officials, uh, the county's board of commissioners, um, as a courtesy, engaged Mullen and Jenkins to perform an assessment. And, and the point was to provide a historical look back on operations, identify what's working well, identify areas for improvement uh, so that both uh, Judge Peterson and Ms. Stembridge could take the recommendations and leverage that in tandem with their current strategies so that they could currently or continue to implement their vision for each of the offices. Uh, in addition to assessing the probate office as well as the um, uh, superior and state court, uh, we also looked at the county's use of a legal organ. All right, uh, next slide, please. So the for, scope of work was determined by both uh, Judge Peterson as well as Ms. Stembridge, uh, and each person had a little bit of a different uh, objective and, and ideas for what they wanted uh, to be included within scope. Uh, so for the probate office, we, func we focused on three key areas. Uh, one, reviewing the cash handling processes, uh, as well as looking at the consistent application of fees for services. Um, the, the probate court charges a lot of uh, different fees for different services and different service types, and, and we wanted to ensure consistency uh, and application of those charges. Uh, second, we looked at record retention practices, and third, we looked at key management roles and functions. Uh, next slide, please. So we've identified, and this is obviously an executive summary, uh, and, I, and I'm being succinct, but we have a detailed report uh, for each office, as well as the review of the county's legal organ. And, you know, the, the detailed report definitely should be read in, in, in full to understand that the context and the entirety of, of our observations and recommendations. What I'm speaking to is, is certainly a high level summary, uh, and I would say more of the key observations. Uh, so right now in, in probate court, uh, there's not a sign in system uh, that tracks volume during the day. And the reason why that's important is that not all clerks are currently trained on all services. So leading practice in other probate courts is to have an electronic sign-in system, uh, maybe some type of numbering or queuing system. The customer states the type of services they're interested in, and this helps better manage the customer workflow and also better align the clerks that are able to serve them um, to, to ensure that they can serve them. Um, multiple shared computers uh, that are used by the clerks and, and there's not any uh, internal security protocols requiring them to be logged off or to automatically time out. Um, also, as I mentioned before, because not all clerks are able to satisfy every single customer request, um, often you may have a clerk start with the customer and then it transitions to a different clerk who's more knowledgeable in that specific service area. Um, this certainly from our observations we, we saw uh, when that handoff occurs there may be um, cash or credit card information that is being handed off to another clerk. If that clerk is busy um, that information sits on a desk. So we, we certainly have you know recommendations related to um, unattended payment information being stored more securely to help reduce any any threats. And next, please. Um, ICON is the system that is used by the probate court uh, to basically administer the, the fees of service as well as to issue uh, various permits. And, and with the, the transition, there certainly have been people um, that have retired and, and have left the probate office. And, and right now there's not anybody that's fully trained or fully understands all the capabilities of ICON. Uh, so we have a recommendation to certainly become learned on, on ICON. 
Um, also, there is you know potential to look at a, a different system that really focuses on on probate functions and and, and needs. Uh, so we have uh, obviously a recommendation that you know somebody should be able to understand um, its full functionality until or if and when a new system comes about. We looked in terms of service fees. We compared. Um, what is stated in Georgia law uh, for what's allowed to be charged for different probate services. We also looked and compared to what is an ICON, so what ICON is programmed to charge for those services and fees, and we also looked at the county's fee schedule. Uh, we, we noticed a, a number of discrepancies, um, specifically where ICON or the, current, the county currently is charging uh, less than what is allowed or suggested by law. Uh, also, as you know, Peterson is making changes. Um, you know, the, the there certainly is a, a transition time period, and, and as these transitions are being made and, and once they're finalized, we certainly recommend um, formal, comprehensive written policies and procedures, uh, as well as using what we refer to as job aids, so that everybody within the office fully understands everybody's role, responsibility, and and how to do their job. Uh, related to records retention, um, also there, there was no formal policies related to um, record retention in terms of really defining the structure, uh, defining destruction time periods, uh, as well as retention, and, and those certainly should be developed. Uh, next slide, please. And we have two left on, on probate. A and Records retention and, and storage right now is a shared responsibility, and, and our recommendation is that there should be a, a single person that's that, that's in charge. Um, my point of view is that when there's a shared accountability structure, it often results in no accountability. Uh, so having a single person be ultimately responsible for records management. And lastly, um, as I stated before, you know, in addition to having policies and, and, and procedures and really having defined roles and responsibilities. Uh, we, we think that it would be a great idea to have the office or the judge lead a formal strategic planning session. Um, this way she can roll out her organizational chart, her functional organizational chart, and, and really explain to all employees uh, what her vision is for the, for the office. Again, there's been a lot of transition and a lot of change, and now as that change continues or once it's complete, we just need to formalize it and document it so that it's certainly understood and transparent. Okay, moving to the next slide. Uh, the scope for the state and superior court office was more of a, um, a, a less targeted scope, but really wanted to understand uh, how to have a snapshot of a current state. So we looked at operations, functions, organizational alignment, and roles and responsibilities. Uh, next slide, please. So key observations for state and superior court, um, and this was similar to, to probate, is that there's a lack of office-wide policies and procedures and, and job aids. Uh, as well as, or similar to probate, the offices of state and superior court have um, switched, switched roles around, have moved people, have brought in new people, and, and so there's certainly a lot of, lot of transition. And again, these, these formalized documents certainly need excuse me, needs to be created and, and shared with everybody so that they can be trained and fully understand. Okay, um, what's looking at uh, number three, most documents that for which the clerk of Superior Court is responsible are not available online to the public. And, and so certainly that they are public documents and they can come into the courthouse and, and print them themselves. However, leading practice and a number of other, other peers uh, certainly have uh, digitized these forms and, and made them available on the internet uh, so that the public can access them as, as needed. Next slide, please. So conclusion from, from both, you know, the, the probate office as well as the state uh, and superior court offices is, you know, there, there is new leadership and changes are, are being made. Uh, change, change is certainly a constant for, for everything. Recommendations were really designed so that it can better, you know, Judge Peterson and Ms. Stimbridge can take our recommendations 
and marry them with their thoughts and visions and strategies and, and continue to implement um, their, their thoughts for each office. Uh, what we did review was uh, based on historical information and past performance and uh, everybody was very responsive and it was a pleasure to work with in those two offices. Next slide, please. Uh, the third part of our scope was to assess the county's current relationship um, between the uh, Sentinel uh, and, and Douglas County. And the Sentinel serves as the county's legal organ or publication where the county is required to um, publish or basically publicize legal notices. Uh, our scope was designed to, one, confirm compliance with statutory and governance requirements, uh, two, compare the Sentinel's fee and publication schedules with other legal organs in nearby counties, and three, to assess the current agreement between Douglas County and the Sentinel. Next slide, please. So we have a few observations here. Uh, and again, we have certainly have a detailed report. Uh, this is very uh, high level, succinct summary. Uh, but number one, Douglas County does not currently have any local ordinance requirements for the designation or review of a legal organ. Uh, there absolutely is state governing requirements, but often um, local ordinance requirements help to better define some of the ambiguity and, and gives the local county the opportunity to really define their process with a level of greater specificity. Um, so we certainly recommend that the county consider adopting new local ordinances specifying the requirements and the state requirements also the state also requires that there are three people within the county uh, that are uh, responsible for approving the county legal organ. Uh, the first is the judge of probate court, the second is clerk of superior court, and the third is the, the sheriff. And so our recommendation is to consider creating local ordinance requirements specifically related to these three um, positions and how they would formally go about approving and how often they would approve a legal organ. Uh, number two, there's not currently any agreement or contract between Douglas County and, and the Sentinel. Um, so we went, went back and worked with procurement and we could not find any type of formal uh, legal or executed contract. Um, one of the things that we certainly are, are recommending, um, and let's see here. Um, sir, if you can go to slide 10. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, one more please. There we go, I'm on number two. Uh, so in, one of the requirements is that the publication has to um, prove that they have had an audit done that shows their circulation. So there are certainly are a number of requirements that the state uh, governance outlines and, and what the criteria is to be considered a legal organ. Um, and as the county goes forward, whoever they choose as their legal organ certainly needs to provide proof of that audit and circulation annually um, so that the judge of probate, clerk of superior court, and sheriff can confirm that um, either the Sentinel or another provider uh, meets those requirements. Next slide, please. And so, as we could not find a contract, uh, we also, within the past 10 years, could not find any evidence of the county uh, reviewing or soliciting any request for other third parties to become a legal organ. And so, we certainly have a recommendation that there should be an RFP, a formal request for proposal, uh, to invite all eligible publications uh, to apply and submit proposals to become the um, uh, legal organ for the county. Uh, in addition, as a part of that procurement process, uh, the county should request documents and evidence of uh, from each of the proposers stating that they meet all of the OCGA mandates. And lastly, number four, um, we, we did some comparison of rates that Douglas County was paying compared to other, other nearby counties. Uh, the, the rates appeared to be um, somewhat similar, and we looked at both rural and metro Atlanta counties. Uh, there are things that the county can do to potentially try and reduce costs, 
uh, as well as looking at the exact verbiage that they are using for every publication. Uh, and obviously going through the RFP process uh, gives the county some, some opportunity to negotiate things as, as well. So in conclusion, uh, based on our observations and recommendations, um, we believe that the county should release a solicitation, a request for proposal, and basically ensure that the county has a formal contract with governing provisions and with an organization um, serving as the county's legal organ. Uh, ensure that whomever that legal organ is, that it's in compliance with all applicable governing requirements. And, and, and third, that the county is receiving uh, applicable market rates based on publication and distribution and, and exposure. Uh, with that, I will will pause. I know I was fairly quick. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I really do appreciate uh, Vice Chair Robinson's support and as well as Judge Peterson and Ms. Stembridge uh, for their making their staff available and their their thoughts throughout the process. Thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. Uh, Roberts, Board of Commissioners, do we have any questions for Mr. Roberts? Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Vice Chairman Robinson, you have yeah. the floor. I'm, I'm not certain. I mean, obviously, well, two things. I'm, I'm going to yield in the event if there's any constitutional officers that are out there. Um, obviously, they don't have to respond, but we respectively, since they are elected, um, and uh, I'm willing to yield first, Madam Chair. You can always come back to me. So that, that's on you. Your pleasure to offer them to speak now. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Do we have any constitutional officers on the the line this morning, uh, particularly our probate judge or our superior clerk, court of clerk, and then also, last but not least, our share. Is anyone available on the line? Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, probate, probate judge. judge. Yeah, there you are. You have the floor. All right. Thank you, judge um, all Vice Chairman uh, Robinson and um, Malden and Jenkins, David Roberts. Um, I wasn't, I, I guess, it was very important to me to be a part of the audit because I wanted to see what was going on historically um, before I got in office and to actually see what I inherited. Um, a lot of the policies and things or, or the, th the things that you've witnessed basically is from um, I inherit an inheritance. So I think it's important to note there has a, been a lot of changes here. So I don't think we didn't really get into all of the things you uncovered, but um, like I said, I'm about the law. Everything is to the law. Um, and that's why I am recommending uh, transitioning to CJT, which is a new software. All of the statutory fees that we are required to charge will be implemented up on the Im implementation date. Um, you also see, uh, a lot of the policies and how there wasn't a, legal, a guide, there wasn't a policy manual, all of these things I have since created. And that is a lot um, on within my first hundred days, you know, that's a lot uh, to put on me as well as having to implement uh, hire new staff and all of that. So um, I am committed to it. And I, I, I also thank the county, the citizens for uh, giving me the opportunity to be your probate judge. But I just want to say I, I am I'm on board to getting this uh, office um, in compliance with the law I've asked for. I have reached out to uh, Madam Administrator. Hopefully uh, she's willing to work with me to get additional things that the probate court needs to be in compliance with the law. I am here. Um, if you all have any questions, any of the citizens have additional questions for me, I will make myself available uh, to speak more about the operations and the improvements here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Judge Peterson. Any other um, Constitution officer would like to make some remarks at this time? Being none, I yield back to you, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, and which brings us to, again, to the citizens, uh, for those who may be interested in, please reach out to the respective constitutional officers regarding the areas. If you have more questions, um, I believe this, um, this operational assessment, as we call it, um, is available publicly. Um, it is the same provision that we gave Madam Chair in the class of 2016 when they came in regarding the coroner and drug forfeiture and the sheriff, et cetera. Uh, we thought it was always important to get that baseline um, for those newly elected officials. So this is just a continuance of that. Uh, it brings me to my last point about the Sentinel. So, Mr. Roberts, I want to clarify that 
Uh, there's always been some misconceptions about the legal organ, and you've obviously made it very clear um, through your recommendations of some actions that should be taken. But it sounds like the the the, the responsibility lies with um, um, I'm going to call the three. Um, um, the sheriff, um, the uh, superior court clerk, and the probate judge are being responsible for this. So let me make sure I understand. So in following your RFP, they're the ones that's going to, I guess, command a meeting in which they will vote and codify their decision to change legal order if they so choose, then they would send it over to the board of commissioners who would then extend an RFP um, um, to the um, to other um uh, potential um, um, publications. Clarify that for me, just as an order of process. Yes, sir. A a absolutely. So, so based on on the OCGA code, obviously the that group of three, as we spoke of, uh, they are the ones that are formally responsible for approving. So, I think from a an administrative perspective, the th those three individuals would certainly want to work with with procurement. Um, to develop the RFP and and to solicit the RFP, I, I believe you have the the choice of whether you have an evaluation um, committee, and whether that you know who who that consists of, and whether they take make a recommendation and bring it to the three, or whether the evaluation committee uh, merely consists of those three individuals that are ultimately responsible for for making. Um, all you need is a majority vote um, between those three, so two of those three individuals. Uh, vote the same, then that that is approved, and then it goes to, uh, before the board. Uh, but those three individuals are the ones that are responsibly responsible for formally approving. Okay, all right. So uh, thank you, Mr. Roberts. So, uh, county manager, um, you um, we will talk about this offline um, to clarify. I think publicly we understand that there's consideration needs to be done, but we need to work with those three constitutional officers. Who are driving this and whatever comes back out of that. So, uh, again, I think today was just sort of an, um, a, a, um, a, a, an awareness moment. Um, I don't think that any decision is coming out of this because obviously those that are responsible for this particular action, they need to make a determination amongst themselves. I'm sure there'll be continued conversation. Uh, but right now, Madam Chair, I have no further questions in case my peers want to weigh in. I yield the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. I, I see your hand, Commissioner Guider. I believe you won't. You want to make some remarks, Commissioner Guider? Uh, yes, ma'am, and I will address it to Mr. Roberts. Um, first of all, uh, sometimes fees are requ require a resolution. Did we have any fees that were were not covered by a resolution that should be? Uh, everything, based on my understanding, everything is defined in in Georgia code. Um, so I don't believe that there's a local resolution that is that is required. Okay, because I was told there was uh, by uh, someone from another county. But um, on the Sentinel, um, you know, we have no other paper here. <laughs> uh, so uh, do you count digital subscriptions to the Sentinel? When you, you do count... Yes, you, you do. And, and what you want to ensure is that the um, Sentinel, as, as required by law, or any legal organ as required by law, is performing an audit that is validating those um, circulation numbers, numbers. Is there a percentage of people by population that they are required to um, reach? Do you know? Uh, Yes, ma'am. There's there's circulation, and, and it's all detailed in our, our detailed report. Um, there's certain uh, percentage that it has to reach from a circulation. Also, there's a certain percentage that has to, um, or threshold that cannot be, um, basically, there can't be, it certainly can't be a, a publication that's full of advertisements. So there's limitations on the volume and number of advertising space that goes in with each publication as well. Okay, and one other question, uh, and this is not really a question, it is kind of like an observation. Uh, years ago when I used to have to set the my budget for the tax commissioner's um, office, um, we had to submit an organizational chart. Is that not being required now in the budget process? Uh, Ma'am, I do not know the answer to that question. 
Okay. Um, we might want to look at that because uh, I, I do know we had to submit it years ago, and I would think that that would be uh, uh, carried through the years. Um, now, you were saying something, one other thing, you were saying something about if uh, uh, the wording or the verbiage could be changed in the ads that might save um, some money. Um, I've noticed that they do combine several things like uh, properties that's being sold at a um, uh, auction or uh, the sheriff, if he's having a sale, they do add, they, uh, add them all up and put them in one ad rather than separate ads and everything. So can you give me an example of what we that we could save? Sure. So just when we compared some of the publication notices of what Douglas County is doing with some other counties, the, and there are certainly governing state requirements on what has to be said or publicized. Um, but in certain examples, other counties were a little bit more succinct with their words and, and fewer words uh, typically translates to, to less costs. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. I yield back. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Any other remarks from the board? All right, thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. We appreciate your presentation this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, Board of Commissioners, we're gonna move on to our next item, which falls under the public hearing category, uh, tab number eight, to consider changing the street name of Don Foods Parkway to ba uh, Baker's Lane Pursuant to a request from the new owners of the facility. Director Valentin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, uh, commissioners. This is a request by the new property owners to change the name uh, of the public road that accesses their facility. Uh, they are the only improvement that does access from that road. There are a couple other parcels that are unimproved uh, those property owners have been notified of the proposed name change and um, it, it, it will be before the board for consideration tomorrow um, at the formal hearing. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you so much, Director Valentin. Any questions from the board regarding this uh, name change? Okay, Board of Commissioners, we're going to move on to tab number nine, request approval for the Lynn Branded um, Buffet Incorporation DBA Cot uh, Tail License, Licey, Gin Lynn to serve beer and wine on premises located at 855 Thornton Road, Lithia Springs, Georgia, 30122. Manager Roberts, Ron Roberts, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board of Commissioners. Yes, we have mm -hmm. a completed packet from uh, Mr. Lynn. I have a confirmation this morning that he will be available tomorrow for the public hearing. Um, he has gone through his RAS certification. Uh, we have the uh, public notice in, in the paper. Everything is in the packet and we're good to go. If you have okay. any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Manager Roberts. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Do you have any questions or remarks? Thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. We're gonna move on. Uh, Board to grants, tab number 10, we have one grant authorization to approve the FY 2021 First Amendment Aging Services contract with the Atlanta Region Commis Regional Commission and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Dr. Gilchrist, you have the floor. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody? Good morning. Oh, everybody. Yes. Good. This um, amendment is a result of ARC allocating the remainder of the Initial Cares Act funding they received. They allocated it to counties in the metro Atlanta area. And as a result, Douglas County, we received $49,281.31 to be used for our congregate and home delivered meals program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilchrist. Board of Commissioners, you have any questions around yes. this? Uh, okay. Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Dr. Gilchrist. 
Yeah, quick question. Just again, we appreciate that this is going to go to our, our seniors. It's an aging grant. Uh, and not what I understand, this is for our meal program. Give us some volume. Give us some context as how much do we normally serve? What does this do to increase capacity? I mean, I mean, when I hear these presentations, sometimes I'm trying to, you know, I need some context. So is this a good thing? Is it relative? I mean, are we on target to meet the needs of the community? Give us a little bit more background, please. Yes, Commissioner Robinson, absolutely. So our original contract amount for the CARES Act was $112,980.00. $0.26. And with that, we've been able to serve approximately 200 um, seniors just with the CARES Act portion of our contract with the Atlanta Regional Commission. And that equates to about 2,770 um, meals that we've been able to serve. This increase of almost $50,000 will also increase the number of seniors that we'll be able to serve. So with that, we should be able to serve an additional um, 4,900 meals and about 250 um, additional seniors or to add to the seniors that we're currently serving. And so the total seniors served then, give me Roughly. The total seniors that we'll be able to serve with the new funding will increase to about 250 seniors or about approximately 5,000 more meals. 5,000 more meals. Okay. I'm just, uh, my, my, I know Commissioner Carthen has much better insight into this, but I want to keep up with this to, so I can, uh, so I can support it better in the future. So um, thank you, Dr. Gilchrist. That was a softball um, lob to you. I know you was going to hit that out the part regarding the, the, the financials. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Gilchrist? Okay, thank you, Board of Commissioners, and I'm going to move on. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilchrist. We're going to move on to tab number 11, and this starts, this begins our new business items. This is the beginning of the business items. Tab number 11 is authorization to utilize Source Wells Cooperative uh, Purchasing Agreement with Tyler Technologies, Technologies for the procurement of the IAS software for the Tax Commissioner's Office and authorize the Chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Director Evers, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Replacement of the software for the Tax Commissioner was approved by the Board on April the 20th, 2021. This action will provide an approved purchasing method to accomplish this directive. Section 9-31, Corporate Purchase Agreement of the Douglas County Code of Ordinance authorizes the purchasing agent to join with other governmental units and corporate plans when the best interest of the county would be served. Corporate purchasing is procurement conducted by or on behalf of one or more public procurement units as defined by the American Bar Association model procurement code for state and local governments. Okay. Thank you so much, Director Evers. Board of Commissioners, you have any questions regarding this uh, agreement with tech, um, Tyler Technologies? Okay. Yes. There are no questions. Yes. Oh. Commissioner here. Robinson. Uh-huh. Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. All right. So let me make sure this is, is this the tax commissioner's system? that we spent probably the past six months talking about. I just want to make sure. Is that a true statement? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, second to that, since it's that, and um, will this contract that we're about to enter, will it have multi-year? Uh, how, how, the, the, how does it work? Year to year renewal, one time, five years, 10 years? Give me one second. I'll pull that information. All right. All right. Madam Chair, can I jump in? You you may. Uh, County Administrator, you have the floor while um, our director is looking for that information for our vice chairman. You have the floor. It is a multi-year contract, and the county's attorney is going over it to make sure that it meets the um, legal requirement where it um, allows for, for, or it's consistent with, with state law as it relates to multi-year contracts. But it is a multi-year contract. Um, Dawn, did you find the amount yet? Yep. Well, honey, Minister, what you doing? It's okay. Question for you, so since you, you're familiar with it, 
Um, what's important to the Board of Commissioners when we talk about multi-year, there's no, we, we have this issue we call forever contracts. Um, and that there's no auto renewals. And that the Board of Commissioners recognize we can't bind future um, administrations to prior decisions. So is there an annual out? And I, I want to know what those specific provisions are. Um, can you speak to that part? Well, I'm not the, the county's attorney, and I, I don't even play one on TV. And so it really, Ken is very aware of that provision, and, um, and that actually was part of the delay in finalizing the contract. Um, but he is certainly working all of those pieces in to ensure to, um, that the, the county is compliant and ensuring right. that it's not a quote unquote forever contract that binds us with um, with future funding that is beyond the scope of this board and is, is able to be renewed on an annual basis. Right, and let me, let me clarify, I'm gonna ask Ken, he can jump in here in a second, uh, which is, which, which is um, if the board, if there's an annual decision to award a contract and the board chooses not to take that up, I, I, I want to. I want that language to be clear, and I want that also be aligned with our ordinance. That um, if this is back, the board just chooses not to renew it. And so I, I'm I'm trying to get a feel for what we're being bound to, because it, it, here's the thing: is we always have to have the right to say, just like with any employment agreement, service agreement. If we're not satisfied with um, productivity, and that's I mean nobody's exempt. Even me on four years, I, I have to go through that process. So this is for everybody to hear. Nobody's exempt. Nobody's above the law. Nobody's above our ordinance. And so I, I, I know I'm, I'm buying time for Don because I actually want to see what's written. And Ken, you can weigh in, but what, what's actually written regarding this point? And, and county administrator, it's okay that they, they, they should. That this is something that already preexisted. So, Don, are you ready? I had technology technical difficulties with my PC, so it went down on the paperwork that I had pulled up. So I'm pulling it up manually. Yeah, Ken, uh, County Attorney, you around? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, we're having the same problem. There was a tree that fell down on Campbellton Street while y'all were in this meeting. So my server's down. Let me boot it back up, and as soon as I get it up, I will answer your question. But uh, generally speaking, Commissioner Robinson. You can't have a multi-year deal without an annual way out. Not uh, under state law, the law is pretty clear about funding sources. It's also uh, pretty clear about getting out of uh, contracts. But as this particular deal, I, I got to pull it up to read you the language to it, and it's going to take a minute. Okay. All right. So, and by the way, it's a public service announcement. Nobody should go down Campbell Street right now. Yeah, well, I got knocked off because the, the horns was going over here on Riverside, so I had to duck out for a minute, but it's all good. So real quick, Madam Chair, I'm not going to belabor this. This is a work session. I'm sensitive, and I, again, we get that we just we have inclement weather and everything's off. So I, I'd like to have this answer by tomorrow. How about that, guys? So I'm going to give all three of y'all a chance to sort of circle around, and can we have this answer when this tomorrow? Um, I have no problem with what's on the agenda regarding Tyler Technologies and moving forward. I just wanted that clarity. So, Madam Chair, for the sake of the meeting, I'd like to yield the floor and ask that they get back, if somebody get back with me before the end of the day uh, regarding this matter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. I'm going to ask if our Director Evers could get back with you and also our Attorney Bernard. And I know our account, County Administrator will be there to weigh in uh, with our Director as well uh, to provide you this detail uh, for tomorrow's meeting. Yes, If there's nothing, if there are no other remarks, uh, regarding um, tab number 11, we're going to move on to tab number 12. Tab number Madam 12. Mm -hmm. I have the information. Okay. You, you ready? Yes. The annual okay. in fees for initial term is $237,276. The implementation services is $576,132 with the estimated travel expense of $69,000. What's that total? Total I, I, I repeat again, the annual fees for the initial term, $237,276. The implementation, implementation services, 
$132, and the estimated travel expenses, $69,000. Got it. So, all right, I got it one time upfront free of 500 some thousand, ongoing annual. I got it. Um, what is the expected? While well, I know the binding, y'all going to get that language. I mean, once we commit to this system, now we, we've got this new system. Uh, what is the implementation time frame associated with this? And this is two part question. What is the implementation time that it will take uh, that, that's in the scope of work? Two, this, Don, you may not be able to answer this, but I'm going to speak to uh, Alejandro, um, our, our brand new director of IT. How do y'all plan on implementing this? Now, I'm looking at what our experience right now. I know we've got a smaller project going on with our, our court of probate. Um, and uh, in working through that system, I, I'd like to know that within this scope of work, um, when will we get a schedule and how you're going to give the task commissioner assurance that we're going to get these records right? There's going to be proper user testing, data mapping. I, I mean, I get they get, they're getting out of this their money. And it's real clear when they get their money. But how? what is going to be our experience in going through this over the next, what, six months, 12 months, or 18 months? Um, can the you know, county manager, you probably, can you speak to that? I, um, you know, this is this is one of the, um, I'm kind of, walk. Alex and I are both walking in after the decision's yeah. been made. And so part of what you do with these kinds of projects is sit down in the beginning with the vendor and have, you know, an implementation kickoff meeting and they lay out what's required of us and, and we understand what's required of them consistent with what's being called out in the contract. Um, clearly, we haven't had the chance to do that yet. And when we do, then we'll be able to come back intelligently with the tax commissioner and give him a, a schedule. And, and obviously his representatives would be at that table. So there will be clarity around expectations. And so that eliminates confusion, that eliminates unmet expectations, that helps everybody to be on the same sheet of music. So our expectation would be in the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll schedule that with the vendor and with the task commissioner's staff and of course with Alex's staff. So we get a good understanding of what is expected of who, kind of who's on first. And um, you know that, that becomes part of our rhythm in how we provide service as well as how we support um, county departments. You know, we have a lot of, internal challenges um, right here at home with everything from basic connectivity to um, software for um, the procurement department. So um, we have to kind of wrap our arms around that planning and make sure that we um, project out and, and make sure that we have the resources to support everybody in, in their needs. Uh, well stated and duly noted. Uh, I do recognize that, um, that that this is a new team, new IT, new county manager. Right, get you guys' minds around this, and I can make a make a condition tomorrow to to ensure that you get the coverage you need to get this done because it it's that important to digest. Yes, now, sir. Right. right. So I I want. I mean, so if I need to spell it out and hopefully my peers will support the need, like, guys, y'all need a, a, a formal project delivery methodology, business requirements, the technical requirements to a design, to develop, to deploy. Show me you guys understand what this means. Can you transfer the system? You really can't. I mean, if we're talking about the probate, which is a much smaller component, right, for $20,000. We're talking about the system that controls all the money, that pays the bills, that does everything that it needs to do to try to generate and collect. We got to get this one right. So I just, um, this is this is more of a cover for you. County manager, I'm with you. Uh, whatever you need to do this, if you need to bring in a team, um, like we're, we're, who's going to be that pro that program director? Now, this is where this is context why we don't rely too much when it came to the SPLOS, which is why we brought in um, uh, Moreland and Russell to manage. Because sometimes this is not what we do day to day. We maintain stuff, but we don't really implement all the time because these systems live longer than most of you guys been alive in the office, right? It, it, these systems been around a while. 
So it's important that we, if we need subject matter, I mean, a, a project delivery team, you need somebody here who's done this before, and we need to get that. I mean, so we didn't have a problem with playing four points um, on $100 million to make sure we deliver these buildings and all these projects associated with spots, because again, these guys do what they do day to day. And so please feel free to know that we're, we're here to support that. And I'm gonna let you make that call, but we can't miss on this. And we, and again, the task commission is posted to collect. His, not, his job is not to deliver systems. That's not his job. It's, it's to pull out of him from an expert on what's needed, but it's not his job to cover this. So I've gone long enough, Madam Chair, yeah. I yield the floor. I think well, we're Madam, Madam Chair, I, can, I think I can address uh, Vice Chairman's question now. Oh, okay, but you know what, um, uh, Attorney Bernard, if we could just uh, contact our Vice Chairman, we have an emergency. We've had a t uh, tornado touchdown in Douglas County, and I need to allow the uh, Jason Mulholland to go forward so he can uh, leave the room. He has tab number 16 and respectfully, Board of Commissioners, if that's Absolutely. okay with you. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jason Mulholland, Director Mulholland, you have a, the floor, and then I know you need to exit this meeting immediately. I, uh, this is a, we also have a bowl planning that worked on the, this is the hazard mitigation plan, plan for the Douglas County. We update this plan every um, five years. It kind of gives us a game plan for the county on how we want to mitigate um, hazardous weather and different other types of hazards in the county. Um, so it gives us an idea of what our hazards are, what, uh, what we can do to lessen those impacts and come up with projects so we can uh, apply for funding from FEMA under hazard mitigation grants. It's a, this was about a one year process developing this, uh, developing this pl um, plan with um, local partners in the county and the city and water and sewer authority and our partners at uh, Bowl Planning that help us with our planning software and our planning process. So we're just asking you to, to approve our new hazard mitigation plan so we can continue to do good things with, their, um, with, uh, with mitigation within the county. Okay, any questions from the board? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Director Mulholland. And please keep uh, myself and the county administrator and the board of commissioners posted. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. And I'll be calling you momentarily once this meeting is over. Okay, board of commissioners, we're gonna move on to tab number 12, authorization to renew the contract with Transitions Commute Solutions for operation of Connect Douglas Fixed Route Flex and ADA Paratransit Bus service and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, Manager Shepard, you have the floor. Good morning, Madam Chair and all. Uh, thank you. This will be the third year for Transitions Commute Solutions to operate our fixed bus route services, also to include the Flex and ADA. Uh, the contract will be from May 7th, 2021 through May 6th, 2022. We just like to authorize um, Madam Chair to uh, sign up the contract. And I'll answer any questions if you have them. Okay, any questions from the board's board or remarks? All right, thank you so much, um, Manager Shepard. We're going to move on to tab number 13 authorization to enter into the. Okay, okay. Commissioner okay. Guy, I'm so sorry. I was trying to get my hand raised and everything. Okay, I didn't see you. <laughs> you have the floor. Director uh, Shepard, could you give us, uh, not today, but could you give us the latest numbers for the fixed rate routes? Could you send it out to the Board of Commissioners? Yes, ma'am, uh, we'll do. The, 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 ridership, the ridership routes, ma'am? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Thank will. you. Yes. All right. I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Board of Commissioners, if there are no other remarks, we're going to move on to tab number 13. Uh, authorization to enter into an agreement with the collaborative firm to provide marketing and public outreach enga engagements for Connect Douglas Transit and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Uh, Manager Shepard, you have the floor again. Thank you. Yes, again, this contract will be for the duration of uh, 2021 for the collaborative firm to continue our public engagements and also help with our marketing ploy to get the word out to the public that the transit system is still operational, we're operating safe, reliable, and efficient, and also that we are complying with all CDC uh, current COVID regulations. So we ask the board to also uh, agree and also have this contract also signed by the Madam Chair. 
and I'll answer any questions if you have any. Okay. Any questions for Manager uh, Shepard, Board of Commissioners? Yes. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh -huh. Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Yeah, this is related to the prior question. This is, um, they're both related, which is, um, I was under the impression that all um, most service agreements were done at the first of the year. Um, and, um, and this has a funding source that obviously is coming from the federal. So I, I'm sensitive if, if there's a different response to our, our calendar versus, you know, the other funding source. So can you answer why we're, and I know our, our bus system started in April, basically, or April or May, something like that. Uh, so how do we get this on an annualized, uh, along with all of the contracts versus sort of this midstream? I'm just, again, county manager, what we're trying to do is ensure consistency. And there may be certain exceptions that it, it may, you know, allow it for funding. But can somebody answer that for us? Because again, you're in your third year. Is there a reason that it's not aligned with the annual contracts at the beginning? Or I'm just asking, I'm not forcing it one way or another. Can we answer yeah. that? Y yes, sir. I, I think I can. Uh, although Mr. Gary Watson uh, originated the uh, the contract with the TPO, because we started our service in June of 2019, and they asked for the contract to go from, uh, I, I think, tw May, May of 2020 to May of 2021. Uh, so how we can probably mitigate that instead of doing the, like say, the midstream year, we can ask or request that the, the contract go for an 18 month to end at the end of the fiscal year instead of going into the middle, just about the middle of the fiscal year, which is May. Uh, so I, I think that could uh, rectify that one concern in regards to the trans transitions uh, commute solutions contract. But so we've just been following with that annual contract that was uh, approved by the board to go from uh, May to May. All right, I'm going to yield, Madam Manager. I'm going to let you work that out. We're open. Yes, sir. I think you guys are going to work with your vendor accordingly. Uh, I mean, again, it was just one of those. We we like to do them all at one time if we can, but we know there are certain conditions and reasons why we may not. I'm not pressing a point here. I'm just highlighting something that perhaps you can look at. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Thank yes, you for the time. Yep. Thanks, okay. sir. All right. Thank you so much. Any other remarks from the board? If not, I'm going to move on to tab number 14. Tab number 14 is authorization to enter, uh, enter into a project framework agreement with GDOT for allocation of federal funding for design of the Lee Road uh, South Sweetwater Road, uh, Road Widening Project P1-0013563 uh, in the amount of $567,000 with a local match of $113,400 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final review. Director Valentin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. This this agreement is for the design of that project. Uh, it will facilitate the flow of federal funds just for the design component uh, uh, to the tune of $453,000 in federal funds. Uh, there, there, uh, this project was started back in the early 2000s, and then it was uh, shelled for a while and we're looking to get it restarted again. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Yes, I, I gotta ask this one. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. All right, so that, uh, Director Valentin, uh, again, we're, so is this considered phase, what, one of the Lee Rose? So this is going from I-20, so we're going into Commissioner Mitchell's district. Can you give me some clarity on what we're talking about here? Are we talking about this just part of the design to get us over to veterans? Is this one component it, it of is, that? Okay. It is, Commissioner. This this is actually when when uh, the, the original phasing of the project was laid out, was intended and labeled as phase one, and then phase two is the project that uh, goes from, uh, from 92 to I-20. And uh, uh, so the, the bridge project was done initially um, out of sequence, if you will. And so we're doubling back to do phase one. It goes from essentially north of I-20 to uh, Veterans Memorial Highway. So it does go uh, predominantly through uh, District 1 at the top end. Okay. 
And to your point, some things do get out of sync when you had federal dollars. I think we spent about, what, $40 million on that bridge, and we appreciate Congressman Scott in the 13th District for helping spot that. So, Commissioner Mitchell, I'm sure he he understands how that works. They they, they drop it, when, and you got to go get it when, when we have to get it. But to that point, Commissioner Mitchell, this is coming your way. You have always been phase one. I know that's a little bit um, 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 something of great interest to you. So uh, it came up in our transportation committee meeting, and I just wanted to highlight that we hadn't forgot the importance to get to veterans as part of this, um, what I want to say, uh, arterial, you know, sub I-20 um, arterial east-west connector for us. So, uh, Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chairman Robinson, and thank you so much, Director Valentine. Any other remarks from the board before I move on to the last tab, which is tab, I'm sorry, yeah, tab number 15 is our last tab for today. Okay, tab number 15 is authorization of a supplemental agreement number two in the amount of $70,000 on the task order agreement with Southeastern Engineering, Inc., SEI, for design of the new Manchester High School sidewalk project to be funded from the 2016 SPLOST funds allocated to the project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Director Valentin, you have the floor again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this project, and, and I am hoping that we're able to share an overhead uh, just for context, is related to the to the sidewalk project. Um, if you can if you can see the uh, the highlighted area, it looks kind of orange, perhaps a little reddish. Uh, the sidewalk project was originally intended to provide access on State Route 166 slash 92 in that area to the high school and the adjoining uh, subdivisions. Uh, it was intended to be on what is predominantly the west side of the road. And um, we one of the elements of the project was to install a uh, pedestrian traffic signal to allow uh, the subdivision that is to the right on this display uh, to be able to cross at that existing um, road entrance, cross over to the high school side and uh, access the high school for uh, those that are uh, going to that uh, school from that neighborhood. Uh, in discussions with GDOT over the last several months, they have requested that the proposed traffic signal, pedestrian signal, be relocated to the north of that intersection, sort of mid-block. Mid and in order to do that, uh, the sidewalk would have to be extended on the opposite side. Uh, so the, the high school on the, on the left or the west side, and uh, we have to do an extension for that uh, for a few hundred feet on the right side or the east side. As we considered uh, the uh, additional design effort that would be required, uh, we, we thought in terms of uh, providing accessibility to the Boundary Waters Park as well. And uh, you can see at the bottom right corner some of the uh, athletic fields, baseball fields, softball uh, for, uh, within the park. And so in addition to having to um, do a, a section of sidewalk to the north of that intersection, we're looking to do one to the south. And if you go to the next slide, uh, um, Rick, if there's another slide, yes. So this would be the additional scope of sidewalk that we would need to do to the north of the intersection. And if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, that that would get us from that intersection across the frontage of the Boundary Waters Park. Uh, this is beneficial for a number of reasons. It, it, it allows safer access from park patents to the high school and vice versa. And it also um, allows for connectivity to the trail system that's going to be uh, expanded at Boundary Waters. Uh, so that the cost uh, of additional uh, design fees is $70,000, uh, and there is sufficient funding uh, to cover it in the project. With that, I'll open it to any questions. Thank you so much, Director Valentin. Any questions from the board or any remarks? 
thank you so much for the update, Director Valentin. Thank you. All right. At this time, do we have any more remarks from the Board of Commissioners? Do you have any comments or anything you would like to make or any announcements before I um, certainly um, ask our uh, attorney, Bernard, if we need to go into executive session? Commissioner Guider, I see your hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I've been reported uh, a lot of damage off of Kings Highway by the tornado mm -hmm. uh, right past Dorset Shoals Road. So uh, just wanted uh, emergency management to know that. Okay. Com County Administrator, you have that. I know you'll get in contact with uh, uh, Director Mill. It's Orchard yes. Road. Orchard sure. Road. What's the name of it? Orchard Road. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, Any we'll be going into damage assessment pretty quickly, and we'll have a report for you by later today. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, County Administrator Dan. We no, have Chair. any other remarks? Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor, and thank you so much, Commissioner Guider, for that update. Yes, th th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Real quickly, um, this past weekend, um, I had um, an HOA meeting with um, Perennial Walk at Lake Monroe, um, about 79 homeowners um, that was built in 2017 that um, invited me out, and they had some uh, an experience that they had regarding erosion control, et cetera. So um, I, while Mr. Dixon's comment is, is, is similar to what they're experiencing in, in Anawake, uh, we've got this situation where developers um, are basically coming into the community, making their money, and they're leaving. Uh, and designs of these homes and uh, of the landscape and topography, it, it's not aligned. So, um, you know, I'll give Mr. Dixon's grace on his frustration this morning with his public comment, which I, I can't help him on the, on the, on the, obviously the legal side. But as it relates to uh, when we let developers, when developers come in here. Right, and and I, I'm looking for the sign-off process. Now, I had two, three communities back to Palmer Falls. I had to fix that. We had to put a moratorium in place. Like, okay, no, you can't do the citizens like that. These citizens were frustrated this weekend. Like, okay, these are brand new homes, and they're three hundred thousand, and, and they had. A, I said, I'll be right back. Right, in other words, like, well, how did this happen? So I would like to uh, Miguel and Gil and. James, I'm going to come and we're going to sit down and find out, okay, what happened out at a perennial walk at Lake Monroe? Uh, what was the sign off process? And it, it just, it, I mean, what I'm hearing again, there's always one side to the story and there's always another side. So you guys know how I do this, but I'm seeing some consistency. I'm back to the development standards and, and back to the, the very thing that we've been arguing with up at the state, which is okay, guys, regarding HOAs and developers and how we make that transition work. But to listen to them citizens this weekend, they love the community. Look, this is a brand new community. And they moved out here and you just, you heard their heart like, and I'm listening to, now I've got a, I'm going out there. And the, obviously I'm, I'm inviting you guys to join me as we assess this. Um, but it's one of those like, okay guys, they're, they're, who's signing off on this long way? Is it just a nod of the developer to let them get in and get out? No, because we have to live with the citizens. We're supposed to be there to protect them, to ensure a proper gating. And so I, I'm just, I've learned enough over 13 years to see how this thing works and we're going to have to do better. We're going to have to do better. So just FYI, I'm sure I had to put that out there and advocate on behalf of those citizens in that community, as I told them I would, and I'll get with staff, um, county manager, I'll double back with you accordingly as I coordinate this uh, meeting with my community. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. If there are no other remarks from the Board of Commissioners, I'm going to... Um, ask our, our attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? Madam Chair, before I address that, will you give me one minute to address a prior question? Because I think the board needs to hear this as a whole, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, so to Commissioner, the Vice Chairman's question earlier, source well on this tax commissioner deal, y'all previously approved the Tyler deal, which is about 800 and something thousand layout, 500 plus uh, two or three hundred thousand layout, but the county the county administrator wanted to make sure the procurement was a transparent procurement. Sourcewell is a cooperative agency that procures government contracts, both K through 12, local government, etc. So what's on today is not really us entering a deal with 
uh, source well. It's us recognizing uh, as a participating entity that source well is the source of procurement since this is a constitutional officer's procurement, but to make sure there's transparency. Source well then goes to the vendor, and the contract before you today is Tyler is a is a vendor in the source source well compare a uh, uh, cooperative. So our deal that y'all previously approved at the last uh, commission meeting becomes an amendment to this deal, so that we know that Tyler's been checked out. Tyler has to meet the, the requirements of the cooperative. The Tyler and the cooperative can end their deal with 60 days notice at any time, or for cause they can end it. There's certain warranties and other bond uh, requirements and all that kind of stuff. And our deal with Tyler becomes an amendment to that deal. Now, I will say that the Tyler deal, as discussed previously, is a multi-year deal because of the initial layout, but it does have a way out annually. Uh, remember, y'all are investing 800 and something thousand, I think, in year one. So I just wanted to make sure y'all understood. The reason why this is on the agenda is the county administrator desires transparency, uh, fluidity, and how we acquire things because you really have a constitutional officer trying to acquire. He's agreed to use this as a cooperative source to make sure it's open and the, uh, to the whole public in the process. So really, we have this is not really a new deal we're entering into. This is a structure for the deal to happen, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, and uh, County Administrator or Don, if I said that wrong, please clarify me. But I think that's what I understand. I'm fine, Madam Chair. You go back. I'm good. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman, and thank you so much, Attorney Bernard. We're gonna. Again, uh, do we need to go into executive session, uh, Attorney Bernard? Uh, I, I said one thing. I said is I said that y'all approved Tyler. Y'all approved the funding of Tyler. This would, I guess, the Tyler would be on an agenda for approval tomorrow downrange. Um, we do need executive session, Madam Chair. We need it for real estate and for litigation, uh, and I think we can handle it without necessarily anybody other than obviously the county manager. I don't know that we need anybody else. Uh, Lisa, can I c confirm that you don't have any board appointments? You're correct. I do not. That's a, so we need it for litigation and uh, real estate, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney Bernard. Citizens, so we will be um, leaving the um, the screen temporarily going into a executive session mode. However, I do encourage you to please remain safe uh, and, and take cover uh, in the midst of what we have going on in Douglas County at this time. Uh, Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved as stated. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We have a motion and a second. When I call your district, please uh, respond accordingly. District 1. District 2? Yes. District 3? District 3? Yes. Okay. <laughs> District 4? Yes. Chairman, yes. We have a 5 0 unanimous vote and the motion carries. Um, Lisa, our clerk, if you could provide instructions for uh, the Board of Commissioners and our County Administrator and our uh, County Attorney. Yes, ma'am. Um, we will ha we will hang up from this call, and mm -hmm. I will call you in momentarily into the executive session. So do not close out Teams, um, and leave that open. But you can hang up from this call. Okay. Thank you. Can we have five minutes, Madam Chair? Yes, you may. It is it is now eleven forty nine. Uh, Board of Commissioners, uh, be prepared to uh, pick up your phones at eleven fifty five. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you so much, TJ. Again, uh, Board of Commissioners, thank you. And uh, we had a very healthy executive session. And again, to the citizens of Douglas County, thank you for your patience regarding our executive session. We are now live again. Board of Commissioners, do you have any re remarks or announcements that you would like to make before we wrap up? And of course, with my closing remarks. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Yeah, just one remark. Uh, again, during this session, we had some inclement weather. Uh, even down here in Riverside and Thornton Road, it got pitch black and the horns were going off and, uh, and, and I got knocked off. But what is the procedure, Madam Chair? Can we refresh the procedure of citizens wanting to get um, direct announcements for the immediate area? Does Jason Milhollands Group um, connect? I know our cell phone sometimes says it, but can we some kind of way reinforce the message about inclement weather and how citizens may not be able to go to our website? Obviously, I mean, how can we refresh what that means and just, you know, um, can somebody speak to that? And, and you don't have to do it now, but I'd like for the citizens to get some type of notice about inclement weather um, as an active, not just to go find something online and some PDF. But can we bring that forward in our next meeting about inclement weather and things of that nature, how to plug in and get communications directly from us um, if, it, if it even happens? I know you and, and the county manager get direct things from um, obviously severe weather, but uh, what about the citizens and yes. can you speak to that? Just specifically for Douglas County, of course. Okay, yes, we will look into that. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, that's a good point. Um, right now we do have, your, I agree, we lean primarily on our website. And then of course the, 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 uh, the actual warning signal, which is the siren that goes throughout the entire county. It's my understanding that uh, there were uh, those sirens were uh, sirens were activated, and uh, of course, and I believe the voice uh, activated voice came over and asked everyone to take cover. But I will actually follow up and get back with this board immediately Thank you. today. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. If there are no other remarks from the board of commissioners, I will close uh, by saying, citizens of Douglas County, we cannot take our eye off this virus. Uh, it is still alive and well. Uh, India is certainly having problems now. In, in their country, and, and that um, does not exempt um, Douglas County nor uh, the rest of the globe. I need you, if you could, please continue to double down on the three W's. Wash your hands repeatedly throughout the day. Watch your social distancing. And of course, wear a mask when in public, regardless of if you've had the vaccine or not. If this virus is serious. It is one that is complicated and complex, and it has been very challenging. Uh, even with our science and the data that's out there. Uh, it, it's just been a moving target, particularly with the variant uh, on the right, but those variants that's on the rise. If there's nothing else to come before this Board of Commissioners, Board of Commissioners, this work session is adjourned and I look forward to our meeting tomorrow. We have a 10 o'clock uh, legislative meeting and I invite the citizens of Douglas County to attend. If there's nothing else to come before this board, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much.